So my thesis is titled Building Information Security, Confidentiality, and Traffic Privacy in the Wireless Networks. Uh, as Professor Trappi said, this dissertation is jointly provided by Professor Trappi and Professor Narayan Madhya. The outline of this dissertation is as follows. It's uh, broken up into three portions. The first two portions are somewhat related in that they both deal with confidentiality. The third part has to do with traffic privacy in network streams. And this will also be sort of the outline that I will follow in this talk today. So I'll begin with an introduction, then I'll talk about these three parts, one after the other, and then I'll end with future directions pertaining to things that I would have liked to do, but I could not, uh, and where things can go afterwards. Uh, so let me begin with an introduction to the first two parts by comparing wireless security with wired networks in a very simple way. <laughs> wired networks provide a very nice physical basis for security in the sense that they limit the data that travels on them physically on, on cables. Okay. But if you compare this with wired systems, the wireless medium is inherently harder to secure because uh, it's a broadcast medium. So if Alice here wants to send a message to Bob, then he can also hear that message. And this leads to two different security problems which make security and, uh, security and wireless harder. Okay. So the first of these problems is what we call confidentiality which is where Alice would like to make sure that Bob and only Bob is the recipient of the message that she wanted to send to Bob. And the other is what we call authentication, where Bob would like to be sure that this message is in fact coming from Alice and not someone else. Now, traditionally, both these problems have been addressed by using the notion of cryptographic keys, either shared keys or uh, a public key infrastructure. Alice would encrypt her message with a key which she knows that only Bob has. Or vice versa, where Bob would get a message encrypted with a key which he knows only Alice has. However, maintaining and establishing these keys in mobile environments is not a trivial task. Okay. So let's take a couple of examples to illustrate this point further and to uh, build on to uh, the first two portions of my work more formally. So this example. Alice and Bob are two wireless users who have never met each other. They, they share no prior trust relationship, and they wish to exchange a secret message. Unfortunately, there's also a malicious adversary in the same vicinity, also a wireless user. We call her Eve. And the question is, what can Alice and Bob do? Well, one thing we, they can do is what is called a diffie hellman key exchange, where Alice and Bob exchange primitives over the air to form a shared key. But we said that Alice and Bob have no prior trust relationship, and unfortunately, Diffie Hellman requires authentication in order to be secure. Another caveat with Diffie Hellman is that, that we should point out is that uh, Diffie Hellman falls in the category of schemes uh, called, uh, that provide secrecy by, by the computational notion of secrecy. What this means is that if why are the observations available to Eve that are going back and forth? And K is the key that is established by Alice and Bob, then it should be computationally infeasible for Eve to derive the same key, K, using her observations Y. Okay. But there's a notion, another notion of secrecy called information theoretic secrecy, also called unconditional secrecy, where Eve does not need to be computationally bounded. In the previous notion, Eve is explicitly assumed to be computationally bounded uh, uh, to, to ensure that she cannot derive the same key. But in this notion, it can be computationally unbounded, okay? And the notion is that the observations Y available to Eve are completely useless to her in trying to derive the key K. Uh, okay. This can be uh, formalized mathematically by saying that the entropy of K or the uncertainty of K, given the observations Y equals the uncertainty of K. So there is no loss in uncertainty. All right, so let's take uh, another example where Alice and Bob already have a trust relationship, but they wish to update their trust relationship. They need to update their keys and I'll take a running example of 82.11 to sort of run through this entire talk to keep getting back to it. Uh, so keep this 82.11 example in mind when I talk about this. Alice and Bob want to update their keys, but the new key is a function of the authentication credentials. And this is a problem because if the authentication credentials are ever compromised, let's say at time t equal to capital T, then all the data from the past it becomes decryptable. Okay. Uh, basically, Eve can record everything that's going back and forth, and, and when she breaks the authentication credentials, she can figure out 
all the confidentiality of the of the past data is also blocked. Now this is not something peculiar to AWS Level. It's a more fundamental problem. And the problem is that there is no easy way to share fresh secret bits independent of all the past shared bits between Alice and Bob. There is no, there is no easy way to do that. Uh, and so the question we pose here is how can wireless channels help? Well, wireless channels can act as a source of shared randomness. And shared randomness has been used as a means to security in the past, most notably, most notably in the context of quantum key distribution, where optic fiber channels are used and the, and the randomness arises from the polar polarity of uh, single photons. What we want to show is that the same type of strong information theoretic secrecy is possible with plain, simple, everyday wireless channels. So let's uh, formalize this by giving a few definitions. Here's our Alice and Bob. Let Xn, where it's true superscript in my slides always denotes a sequence. So Xn is X1 to Xn, uh, denotes Alice's observations, and Yn denotes Bob's observations. And each of these observations are only known to them, they're private observations. Let P denotes publicly communicated information. Publicly means it's available to everybody, Alice, Bob, as well as D. And let there be two functions, fa and fb, uh, which take as input uh, Alice's observations as a public key, public information, and shuts out uh, a value ka, and a similar thing on Bob's side. These uh, k and kb are keys that Alice and Bob can derive. Then this key ka and kb is an information theoretically secret key if the probability of both these keys being equal is arbitrarily close to one. And the amount of information leaked out about this key K uh, measured by mutual information, leaked out by the primitive P is arbitrarily close to zero. And also that this key K is arbitrarily close to the uniform distribution, meaning that H of K, M of K is very close to log of curly K or curly K or K. So this formalizes the notion of an information theoretic secret key. Uh, before I move on to part one, uh, I also need to give a very quick summary of fading wireless channels, because it is the fading process in wireless channels that we're using to derive these keys. Okay, so very quickly, and I guess most of the audience here does not really need this introduction, but uh, just to formalize this, uh, the distortion H of T, which is H of T being a time varying quantity, due to a wireless channel between a transmitter and a receiver, we will say that this H of T is a vector-valued stochastic process. Uh, by vector-valued, I mean that it has time frame and space. And we'll also say that it is reciprocal in the sense that looked from Alice to Bob or looked from Bob to Alice at any given instant of time and at any given frequency, this vector has the exact same value. So if H of T, uh, you know, if you were to look at the magnitude of H of T, it might look something like this. This is just a simulated process, but essentially this is the magnitude of a value varying process. Now the important thing to take home from this slide is that, and this will be useful later, is that H of T decorrelates both in space and in time. In space, it decorrelates over a distance roughly of the order of lambda by two, where lambda is the wavelength of uh, communications. And in time, it decorrelates over the order of what we call coherence time. How did you get calculate the hundreds of milliseconds as a sequence for the other? Um, okay, that, so there's some thing that I didn't include there. So this is with the assumption that if you're moving indoors with at a speed of let's say one meters per second, all the things that are around you that are changing account for a speed of one meters per second, and the Doppler uh, basically you can calculate the Doppler for that, and then there's you can compute the there's an empirical relation between the coherence time and the function of it's the function of the how rate of motion in the environment right and also as relative, well as the relative motion between transmitter and receiver and if nothing is changing in, in the environment it's equal to the others yeah if nothing is changing then the coherence time is infinity and absolutely nothing is changing but practically speaking things are changing people are walking around doors are closing so, okay, so with that, uh, I'll move on to this first part of my talk. 
uh, where we talk about how to extract the cryptographic key from the reciprocal by the same. All right, so like we said, uh, a fundamental problem that exists whenever a key needs to be updated is that uh, fresh keys depend upon, the new keys depend upon authentication credentials. So if the authentication credentials are ever compromised, then uh, the confidentiality of past data is lost. Uh, and this is a problem known as backward security. And the problem really is that there is no, there are no fresh common bits available to Alice and Bob. There are, they have nothing to do with all the past information that they share. So this fact can simply be avoided if Alice and Bob have new fresh bits, which are completely independent of their past shared bits. And we can do this by using the channel as a source of shared randomness. So the channel between Alice and Bob, think of Alice and Bob as being uh, a, an AWS level access point and a, a client, a laptop. Okay. The channel between Alice and Bob can be used as a random source. How? So imagine that Alice sends a probe signal and Bob receives this probe signal and uses the received version of the probe signal to estimate the Alice Bob channel, call this Y1. The same thing can be done in the other direction by having Bob send a probe signal to Alice, she receives it and estimates the channel as X, X1. And this process continues several times until Alice and Bob have a uh, set of correlated values. Uh, let's call them Xn, X superscript N, and Y superscript N. Now, if, if this were to happen, then uh, this can be illustrated nicely in a, in a, in a pictorial manner like, uh, by the following diagram. So what's actually happening is that there is a single stochastic process between Alice and Bob, which denotes the channel between them. And Alice and Bob are observing this stochastic process at different instances of time. Okay. The important thing is that Eve also overhears these probes but the estimates that she derives have nothing to do with our, our they'd be uncorrelated with Alice and Bob's estimates, provided that Eve is located more than half a wave length away from Alice and Bob. So we call her estimates as Zn. Okay, after this, Alice and Bob, now that they have correlated data sets available to them, uh, they can derive a, a, a somewhat similar threshold. Okay, so what they do here is they derive two thresholds which are related to the statistics of their observations. We call these thresholds Q plus and Q minus. And here we have used median standard deviation as a mechanism to derive two thresholds which are above and below the mean, uh, above and below the median. And so using these thresholds, we can define a one-bit quantizer. If, if, a, if the value in the channel estimates lie, uh, lies above the upper threshold, then think of that as being uh, a bit one, and if it's below the lower threshold, then think of that as being a bit zero. And what these thresholds do is that they induce excursions on this stochastic process. So by excursions, we mean uh, whenever the stochastic process goes above the upper threshold, we call that a positive excursion. And when, when it goes below the lower threshold, we call that a neg negative excursion. And to formalize what an excursion means, we say that uh, there's a parameter m which denotes the minimum number of points in, a thresh in an excursion for it to be properly considered an excursion. All right, with that, I'll jump into the, the main part of the algorithm that is used to derive the keys between Alice and Bob. Okay. So essentially what happens is Alice first goes through her entire stochastic process and finds places in her process where she has excursions, either of the positive type or of the negative type. And she index, indexes them, indexes them. She assigns, she picks up the indices and sends these indices to Bob, the time indices. Now uh, Bob, let's, let's call that message L. So message L just contains the indices of where Alice has excursions. Bob uses these indices and tries to figure out whether he also has indices at those, whether he also has excursions at those indices. Okay. And he checks whether the fraction of indices where he also has excursions is large enough. If he has excursions at a very small fraction of these indices, then he suspects that this message L is not coming from the same person with whom he exchanged probes. Okay, so there might be an attack going on and he aborts this attack. Otherwise, he goes on and quantizes his own stochastic process at those same indices and derives bits using the quantizer that we just talked about. Now, the first few bits of this are reserved for a message authentication code and the remaining bits are the final output of this algorithm, the secret key that you want to derive. Finally, Bob sends 
the subset of the indices where he has excursions, along with the message authentication code computed using the first two bits back to Alice. And finally, uh, Alice also quantizes her stochastic process at those same indices and verifies that the MAC is in fact checked, uh, checks out using the first n bits. So essentially what's happening here is that this, the common randomness is being used to derive a common set of sequence bits and some of those bits are being reserved as a message authentication code so that there is no attack possible in the intermediate stages. So one important question to ask here is how many secret bits per second can be derived? Uh, essentially the rate at which secret bits can be derived from the channel. Uh, and this rate basically depends upon the, the Doppler that we talked about earlier. The Doppler rate is essentially a measure of how quickly the, cha the channel between Alice and Bob is changing as a function of time. So as an example, like 2.4 gigahertz is the effective rate of movement in the entire uh, in the environment, in the wireless environment is about one meter per second. Then uh, the Doppler is about 10 hertz, approximately 10 hertz. And so the secret bit rate cannot be any more than the Doppler because our algorithm depends on these excursions and the rate at which these excursions occur uh, is bound by the Doppler essentially. Uh, so this is in fact what we also observed from this algorithm. Uh, in this plot, what we've shown is taking different values of the parameter m, which defines the excursion, and uh, the y-axis shows the number of secret bits per second. So as you increase the number of probes per second, you saturate out at a value around close to 10, which is the, the Doppler of this example. But how many bits per second do we really need? So to take an example, the 811 recommendation says that renew a two-digit bit key every hour or so, uh, which falls out to about 0 0.08 bits per second, which is a tiny number compared to what we're getting from this type of application. Uh, another important parameter of interest is what is the probability of error? So there's, there's always a probability that Alice may have a bit one and Bob will have a bit zero in which case we have an error, right? So if you assume that the channels between them are Gaussian channels, then this probability of error can be numerically computed using uh, uh, basically expressions of a Gaussian PDF, n-dimensional PDF. So we've done this computation uh, after including some amount of noise, okay, so there's always some noise. So what this figure shows is that for various levels of noise, what is the probability that Alice and Bob end up with different bits, uh, a one or a zero or a zero or a one? And this obviously varies as a function of m, which is the size of what an excursion is, minimum size of an excursion. As you increase the size of an acceptable excursion, the probability of error goes down, because the probability that Alice has a positive excursion and Bob has an excursion of the other type uh, falls as we increase n. So just to pick one data point out of this, uh, for m equal to 9 or 10, you would have probability of error about 10 to minus 7, approximately. Just, and this is for all the... Uh, you have an error occurring. Yeah. So Bob and Alice, they quantize their bits and they have some errors. How do we know? They don't know at that point. So there has to be a follow-up to the error. There has to be a follow-up uh, to the key extraction protocol where you actually use the key and you figure out that you don't have to check. So what would be the reasonable follow-up? Um, reasonable follow-up would be something like, let's say you and I form a key, and so I send you a, a, a message, uh, supposedly encrypted with my key, and you try to de decrypt it with your key. And so this would have to be a message which we would know ahead of time, otherwise, you wouldn't know whether this is the right message or not. That's out of that type of order. You need to have you need to have something shared ahead of time. But what's your promise? But they like for you if you what's a problem with a predefined message that's known ahead of time? Is there a problem with that? Well, one problem is that you're trying to establish a key. Uh, and you're saying that you already need to have some sort of shared key at the time. Uh, but I think you could use maybe your authentication credentials if you already have authentication. 
I share with you on some of my videos. And include that video if you do it have to be something known for me. Right. For me. Just in case you get some vacation credentials with secret. Or it could be, I think it could even be something which makes sense to the other person, like, you know, hello, followed by a person's name. It doesn't have to be known. I mean, you can make it up right now. Yeah. I, I sent you, a, I sent him a nonce, and I encrypt that nonce with the key that's close to the key that I have to establish. It's basically, you can then check and verify that. But the issue with such a protocol is it opens yourself up now to another type of attack. Uh, uh, this, 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 like, type of thing, check for that. No, I'm thinking even more basic. This guy over here wants to make certain that we don't establish peace or secret. He knows we're going through this. At some point, he needs to check to see if we have the same thing. He doesn't want us to agree that we have the same thing. That's what will he do? Put in a fake message. And what will happen? Uh, we we'll check it to see whether you have a fake message. Yeah, it's the US. You can't do anything about that, so that's why. The US would be even easier in so many different ways than a lot of times. So I mean, I think fundamentally, you need to understand clearly that's not a fix, right? I don't know if that's the case or what this is. So fundamentally, where is the problem today? Where it come from? It's coming from the fact that uh, the joint distribution that's available to us and Bob uh, is of a type that cannot be partitioned in such a way that Alice and Bob can be guaranteed to have the same fix in order to be able to share So. There's actually a very nice uh, result by Wittenhausen that, that talks about this. Is it possible, if you have shared land map, is it possible to have uh, probability, is it possible to, for us to share the exact same string of bits just by using a, a, a shared common and variable uh, with probability value zero? The answer is no, unless you can partition that into blocks and the cost can be cannot. And the practical kind of cannot. So it's basically coming from, from that. Especially if you go back to this picture, right? What I, what I was trying to show here was if this is a 2 plus m, 2 n plus 1 dimensional cost of space, the errors occur when there's, uh, when prob there's some probability density in these areas, in the in quarters where Alice would have the code of this part and Bob would code of this here. So our, our distributions are not of the type which could fit only the, right, the same type of quarter. How do you determine the threshold values? Yeah, so the threshold values uh, in this here, what we did was we used uh, basically medium of the statistics of the observations that Alice and Bob have and perturbed that by a small factor proportional to the standard deviation. And so this alpha that you see here is basically a control factor that you control how much you perturb this by. So if you, if you take these thresholds apart, also the probability of error falls. But then what also falls with that is the rate because the occurrence of these uh, explosions becomes more and more rare. Uh, so I don't have this on our slide, but it's in our thesis and also in our paper where we show how this quantity varies with the threshold that you select. So uh, I saw some paper they're talking about uh, putting uh, put some object in between Alice and Bob. From so is that to attack your uh, scheme? Yeah, that basically. So I read that paper also. The, okay. So what that paper talks about, uh, which is not what we are talking about, is using signal strength as a measure. For the channel, if you go back to what I said right here, right? So, I I should say here that this Y1 is not simply the received signal strength uh, when Alice sends a probe. If you start using signal st signal strength, such as you know the C signal strength in Angular 11, is a very gross measure of the channel in the sense that it measures the power received over the entire 20 megahertz band. And then if you start uh, doing things like uh, blocking the line of sight between Alice and Bob and not you know, removing your obstacle, then you will see that the receive signal strength is following, you're able to control the pattern in some sense. Uh, here what we are trying to do is use the received signal to actually estimate the channel impulse response. 
it is a much finer measure of the channel between Alice and Bob than any signal strength. Okay. And therefore, it's also much harder for an adversary to control. In the sense that an adversary might put an obstacle in between and not have the desired effect on the channel of pulse response. By the way, how do you determine the, for example, the addition of a metal to have for the, for the uh, I think you need the Alex and Bob both match like a five or a couple this then this, then they become this is one or the other one. How, how do you determine this mass? Are you talking about this message L or something yeah. else? Yeah. So then the length for how many, how many observations above us yeah. Yeah. Oh, and, okay. yeah, that is also a parameter that's kind of flexible. Right? You need to know ahead of time if you have a Gaussian channel of this of a certain type, then m equal to five would work in certain way. For example, in this sim this is a simulation based result, by the way. It's not it's not from measurements because the probability of errors are so small that it's very hard to get the from real data. So here you would know that if you, if you have a channel that roughly follows the cross of six, and if you have noise according to this, then you would know that the idea of doing this is to know that if you have if you set any good ten, you would have probably error ten to the minus seven and four to the So So for practical you will have some simulation first, then do this method do this number for the practical real world. Um, no, you don't have to do a simulation at at the at the runtime, you won't have enough time to do it. Essentially, you, what you would have to do is go through your entire data and figure out uh, how many bits can you get if you set m equal to five. You see, as as you increase the value of m, and also in the real world, in the real case, they don't know. For for Alice and Bob, they don't know at the last how many. Well, they'll know as after they have their entire data set, they would know, right? So Alice and Bob are at this stage where they have this correlated data sets, but they haven't done the actual protocol. Then they would roughly know if they set the value of m equal to 5, they have 10x correct. Right? If you set a value of m equal to 10, you may not have how, 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 uh, how, how the ratio, how many bits they have. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a good point. There, there will be some errors in the end. So what we're doing here is not saying that there won't be any errors. There will be errors, and errors can be fixed using an error correcting protocol. But the point is that these errors can be controlled by trading it an off with the rate. And this is a point that I will talk about in more detail in the second part of the talk, of trading off rate and the error rate. Uh, I was just going to say, it doesn't really matter. I, I will say, Alice and Bob, they set their m equal to 5 and they run around and they get you know, one bit per day and they got one bit per day. If they got you know, 10 bits per minute and they got 10 bits per minute, then the point was that they got 10 nice, pretty darn secure bits. And they know that according to these plots, the bit error, the error rate is theoretically 10 to the minus 5. So they didn't know the direct camera. Well, that's, that's the way all radio systems are built. I mean, there's a nice theoretical Caracas curve describing what I get out of this Wi-Fi card here. Is that what I'm really getting? I don't know. You set it. You set it to a random number. It's a protocol choice. M is a parameter. M is just a parameter. You just say that I take M equal to five instead of four, then you consider some excursions, but you don't consider. No, no, M is not the length of the data set. M is the length of those excursions which you consider. By excursion, I mean those, those shapes that you get above and below, et cetera, et cetera. It's not related, they're independent parameters. So both of these parameters can be used to trade off rate with error rate. So let me not get too much in, into this because I'll talk about trading of rate and error rate in much more detail in the second part. Okay. So, so that that was the theoretical uh, framework for this, and we 
implemented this uh, on a modified eighty zero eleven board uh, at into digital. Uh, and basically, what this board allowed us to do was to use received copies of eighty zero eleven back packets and use a preamble in the packets to estimate the channel impulse response. So we, we estimated 64 point channel impulse response, although we used only the tallest peak of the response to implement our algorithm. Uh, and in this implementation, Alice and Bob exchanged probe messages for at least 10 milliseconds. Uh, it's a 5.26 gigahertz channel. So here is our experimental layout. We basically had Eve and Alice in the same room or a table, and they were uh, apart from one another by more than a wavelength. And we did two experiments, one in which Bob was stationary at another location, and one in which Bob was uh, mobile, he was made to move around a car. And we had somewhat similar results from both uh, experiments. Uh, so here is, here is uh, a pictorial representation of our results from one of the experiments. So this, I think, is from the mobile experiment. Uh, so what we see here is that these uh, the yellow and blue points are uh, successive estimations of the channels by Alice and Bob. And the yellow line is what Eve is estimating. So here, Eve has been configured to listen to uh, Alice. And these black triangles basically indicate the position of these bits. So here it sort of becomes clear what I was saying. Right? Whenever, whenever you have a, an excursion in any particular direction, you assign a bit to that based on which type of excursion. So that. Part of my fault, but I have to ask it anyway. Go back to the one slide. He was sitting right next to Alice. Yeah. Right? Now go back to the bus. Yeah. Over here. How come the signal that he sees is all essentially at zero sitting right next to Alice, whereas the channels between Bob and Alice are, are nice and variable? So he was configured to listen to Alice. Right. And they're right next to each other. Right. Shouldn't the signal be much higher? Oh, okay. Not necessarily. <laughs> there, are two, there are two reasons. One is you might have a nice obstacle between Eve and Alice, like a big computer. <laughs> or uh, Eve may not just be calibrated in the same way as Alice and Bob. So here we're not looking at absolute values of these channel estimates, but the related movements. Okay. Or the DMS. Okay, so I'll end this with uh, an important observation we made from this set of experiments. We ran these experiments for about 22 minutes. Uh, this was actually done, this office building is actually the interdigital office building. This was done at a digital. And so we empirically estimated the mutual information between the, the channel estimates. And this was sort of uh, uh, a result that gave us confidence that yes, this in fact does work. So both in the static case and the mobile case, we computed mutual information between the estimates of Alice and Bob, and Bob and Eve, right? since, since Eve is configured to listen uh, on Alice. So in both cases, you find both cases you find that the mutual information between Eve and Bob is uh, orders of magnitude lower than the that between Alice and Bob, and also that the mutual information in general goes down. Uh, when you have more mobility, and this is not surprising because the channels change quicker. I have a problem with the way you were reporting this. You know the problem is? Uh, I don't 0.00. 0. 0. 0. I don't understand the units. So this came out, uh, the units are that 0. 0.000. No, 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 the units, the bits. Oh, it should be bits per bits per channel views. I mean, it should be bits per channel estimate. Yeah. Yeah. The bits per channel, is it bits per probe estimate? It is bits. 10 mm -hmm. milliseconds, or is it bits per something else? No, actually it's, uh, so these probes, right, uh, if you, if you, if we include all these probes into a computation of mutual information, that's not the right thing to do because successive probes are highly correlated with one another. So what we did was actually we wrapped it around by what we thought was the coherence time or more, and then took only one. So we took, let's say, this pair, 
then another pass on the tail and so on. So that the actual IAG can estimate. So it's per so it's bits per independent per theory. Per bits per estimates per token. Okay, so with that I'll move on to part two of this talk where uh, we have already established some of the theoretical uh, insights and theoretical framework which will be useful in understanding the second part of this talk. And although our, our objective in this part is quite different, what we're trying to do here is how can we pair devices that are in proximity that lack a prior trust relationship? Okay. So to formally state what the problem is, let's say Alice and Bob uh, are trying to form a, uh, a trust-based relationship, a you know, secure relationship, secure pairing, but they have no prior trust relationship. They've never met before. How does Alice know that she's really talking to a user near her? Right? Uh, it's very hard to figure this out. So some examples of this is are you know users meeting for the first time, actually want to exchange data of their mobile devices, or a passenger at the railway station wants to pay a ticket from his mobile device to a machine over the air. And the problem is that it's easy to spoof identity on the wireless channel if you have no prior trust relationship. Okay. Low power communications is not a good idea for security, by the way. Uh, and the reason is that the the reason to which your RF propagates is not entirely in your hands. It's very hard to control this, especially when your potential adversity has a directional antenna. For instance, it's been shown that Bluetooth can be sniffed by you know by an adversary up to a mile away. This was shown by uh, Joshua Wright in 2006. Uh, similarly, near field communication is also susceptible to this type of uh, of uh, eavesdropping. So there are existing approaches for pairing devices for the very first time, but most of these are, most of these are quite cumbersome. Okay, one, of, one of these is the Bluetooth pin, where you enter, physically enter the pin on device A and then uh, again enter it on device B, or you connect them with a cable. Um, another example is a Faraday cage, which you may put devices in a cage for some time so that the EM radiation cannot leak out. Um, and our proposal is essentially to use wireless channels to do this task use the abundance of uh, electromagnetic waves that are already around us to do this. The idea is this. Alice and Bob are uh, within physical proximity. And think of a public source of RF waves. Uh, let's call him Peter. Think of Peter as a, uh, a TV broadcast station or an FM radio station. And from our introduction slide, we know that if Alice and Bob are within half of wavelength, where wavelength is the wavelength of waves emitted by Peter, then Alice and Bob will experience very similar channels from Peter to themselves. So Peter, Alice, and Peter, Bob channels will be, will be very similar. Now, if Eve is essentially farther away from Alice and Bob than Alice and Bob are to one another, then Eve will experience a very different channel from Peter. Okay. So essentially, this the idea is that if Alice and Bob use the EM waves that are already in the air to estimate the channel between Peter and themselves, then what they've done is they've converted this entire framework into this situation, where Alice and Bob now have access to a shared source of randomness, but he does not have access to this source. Okay. Uh, so this is just a formula that I just said. This is Peter, and they have these time-varying channels, but now their channels are, uh, are very similar in physical space. So here, if S is the transmit signal, and HA and HB of T are the time wave channels that Alice and Bob, and ZA and ZB are the noise, uh, then what Alice and Bob receive will be X and Y. So HA and HB of T and HB of T are highly correlated, and A and B are within lambda by two. And it's nice to note that public TV and FM signals have nice wavelengths. You know, nice in the sense that uh, these are of the order of uh, lens that, that one can think of making physically uh, practical applications out of this. So the idea is to pick a lambda carefully depending on the application so that uh, Alice and Bob are within this half of wavelength and your potential adversaries are outside this region. So to explain how we go about uh, extracting a key. So here also we extract a key, but the key can be only be extracted by two people if they are within physical proximity. So I'll go through this example that sort of explains how we extract the key. What I've shown here is uh, 
the channel estimates made by Alice and Bob as a function of time and on the on the y-axis is amplitude. So uh, here we're using an FM radio station, a real FM radio station at 88.7 megahertz, and Alice and Bob are a tenth of a lambda apart, about 34 centimeters. So the first thing we do is we form a threshold. The threshold again can be based on the statistics of the data that Alice and Bob have. And each user basically forms this threshold by itself or herself. So when you look A and B compute, you locally compute these thresholds. This could be, for example, a medium. And then they quantize uh, their channel estimates. And this quantization is done at periodic intervals. Okay. This periodic interval needs to be a quantity that's more than the coherence time. So Alice and Bob could, for instance, estimate the coherence time, or they could basically give this value away to E also, just announce it over the air and quantize the channel every now and then. And by doing this, what they're doing is they're getting a set of bits up. Alice and Bob now have a sequence of bits, which we call W and W prime. Uh, the problem is that Alice and Bob don't have the same bits because the processes that we use to get these bits are not identical. So they have errors every now and then. So the errors are denoted here in red. And so from this point onwards, our task is to fix these errors. So we start with these two bit sequences at Alice and Bob, called W and W prime. And our goal is to get both Alice and Bob to converge to the same bit sequence. So to do this, we use uh, basically use an idea from source coding. Uh, it's source coding with side information. So essentially what we do is have Alice and Bob agree ahead of time on a code C, okay, this code curly C which is simply a, a set of code words in uh, some n-dimensional uh, space. Okay, So essentially what we do is have Alice send an offset, code offset. So I'll use this picture to explain what's going on. Let's make things clear. So think of this square, this rectangle as n-dimensional Hamming space. And these dots are essentially code words. Okay, So they're fixed code words that we know. W and W prime are these n bit long sequences in this space. Alice now computes, just picks one of these dots at random, okay, let's, let's call it C1, and sends an offset, meaning W, which he has, minus C1, this vector, to Bob. Okay, she sends it in the tier, so E also receives it. And then Bob uses this P vector along with his knowledge of W prime to determine W. Now what's happened is that Eve also receives P, but Eve does not know W or W prime. So Eve has received some partial information about W or W prime. She has no idea what W and W prime actually are. Whereas Bob has his additional information about W prime. Uh, so with very high likelihood, Bob will be able to estimate what W is, and finally use the message vector to which this code vector corresponds to as the final key. By doing this, we are eliminating the amount of, uh, amount of information that we out E by sending this P in here. So that's the protocol. And this protocol is unconditionally secure in the sense that it does not rely on E being computationally bounded. Can you explain again what this code offset is? Yeah, code offset is, I think it's useful to think of this in terms of this geometry here. So I've explained this in terms of a diagram. These black dots are basically code words which everybody knows in n dimensional space. And these W and W prime are random. They'll be different for each run of the protocol. So what Alice does is she picks one of these black dots, one of these code words, and she draws a line from the one she picked to her, her sequence W. Okay. So let's think of it as a two-dimensional arrow vector. And she sends this vector P in the clear to Bob. Now what Bob can do in his mind is draw such a line from every single code word, and he will know that at the end of this arrow is where W is, one of these arrows. Since he has W prime here, he would know that it's probably this one. So this P vector essentially helps Bob to figure out where W is. You said she picked one of them. She can pick any of them on at random. She doesn't have to pick the closest one. I mean, you could stick with the, you know. How do you get the exact W in the 
So you get it with very high likelihood. You don't always get it. You don't always get the Right. So if you only know P, then there are multiple possible so you know paths. If you know P and W, so once Bob also knows W and he knows P, obviously he can trace where this that this arrow came from. So he knows the C1. And finally, we don't use this C1 as the key. We use the message vector that led to C1 uh, because we, sh we shrink it by oh, so, so this point. Oh. So 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 the length of the in this is it the same as W W bar or is it shorter? Shorter. So let's take an example of. Oh, the length or the length of the no, the length is the same. The length, not okay. the length. Yeah, the length. The length is the same. The length. They're all end bit sequences. Yeah. Okay. So the X depends if you have the task when you run, it depends if you have the number of the bars you have. Yeah. Uh, exactly. So maybe briefly put this in the context of an N for an AN error correction. Yeah, so if you take an example of a, of a NK, make it simple, a linear. Code. So if n comma k is the code at n of k of k, then you have basically two to the power of k code sequences. Uh, you have two to the n sequences. So uh, essentially, what we're doing, what we're saying is that this p leaks out uh, n minus k bits worth of entropy. So finally, you end up with k bits of entropy. Start with n and go to k bits of entropy. You sacrifice n times k bits of entropy uh, for getting else and for the time Is there any other type of method to to have the such long pointer bits and you have some error when you reduce to some time? Is it this one that that one or there are some types of that or what you think? So in general you have to use some form of coding to Make sure that Alice and Bob have the same sequence with very high likelihood. Essentially, if you want to increase the likelihood that Alice and Bob have the same sequence, then you have to give up something in terms of the number of bits. The number of bits. So it's a trade-off. So no matter what method you use, essentially it boils down to a, some sort of coding method. Okay. Right, so. We took this and we, uh, we did a number of measurements on BLFM and TV channels using a GMU radio framework. Uh, so we used the USRP and GMU radio framework, which helped us sort of bridge the physical world and the software world. It's very easy to do these experiments in software, uh, and it's easy to get these signals from the physical world. So we used both TV channels and FM channels. Uh, TV channels in the 580 megahertz range and the FM channels in the 8200 megahertz range. We also had an analytical model to help us figure out how things would be uh, from a simulation point of view. And the model was we had two order adjusted filters and we feed, essentially we feed white Gaussian noise into both filters. But these two noise processes are correlated with one another. The correlation is given by uh, this Bessel function. So basically the Bessel function controls how much spatial correlation exists between Alice and Bob as a function of the distance between them. Okay. So in the end what comes out of these filters is these two processes which are correlated with one another. They're not white processes anymore and they're also correlated with one another. Okay. Uh, so this is the first of our results. Essentially this plot shows on the y-axis, the fraction of bits that are in error at Alice and Bob versus the distance between Alice and Bob, or I should say the distance between any two points in space, uh, according to our physical measurements on USRP. Uh, and the y-axis shows the fraction of the bits that are in error. Okay. So as you can see, uh, by the time you hit about 0.4 lambda, even, uh, or even, lo even lower, 0.3 lambda, you start to hit about 0.5 on the fraction of bits that are different than Alice and Bob. So you would want Alice and Bob to be somewhere here, ideally. And you would want Eve and Alice, or Eve and Bob, to be 
somewhere in this region so that Eve is not getting any use for it. How can we be sure that Eve's observations are not useful? Which is uh, Yes, so that she's done with in this room and outside in the corridor, actually tidily with rocks, organized with these things together. Also, one of the things that we just did. Do we see the first there? They, we did both. Uh, we did both stationary and mobile. And this is from stationary. Uh, it turns out that the error rate does not depend much on whether they are stationary or not. It depends more on whether how far apart they are. So what we did was we engaged the system between two antennas and kept it to the, and we also moved it around. I'll come to that. Moved it around. We didn't find a reasonable change in the error rate, but we did find a change in the rate at which it gets big now. Okay, so how can we be sure that these observations are not useful? We want to make sure that these observations are not useful in predicting what else is wrong, yes. I guess maybe to clarify Marco's point, yeah. they're separated at some distance from me. Yeah. They're not doing this, which would change oh, the yes. orientation of that block. Right? If they're moving around, oh, yes, that is that. Yeah, but if they're always at this distance, doing this relative to the environment, then that's meaningful. So I, I think his question might have been actually getting at what if they're doing this. Oh, if, if they're that, changing the relative distance between them and the distance between them, then that's necessary. Right. OK, so we wanted to see how whether these observations are useful at all in, in getting mm -hmm. at what Alice and Bob are getting. Uh, so we went back to the definition of what it means for Eve to get anything useful. And, and, and uh, the definition is mutual information. And what is the mutual information in Eve's observations and Alice's observations, or Eve's observations and Bob's observations? <laughs> and uh, so this, these plots, this sequence of plots essentially shows, these are scattered plots that show Alice versus Bob's observations over an extended length of time. Uh, when the distance between Alice Bob, Alice Eve, and Bob Eve are fixed, okay, so here Alice Bob are 0.1 lambda apart, and Eve is 0.5 lambda from both of them. And these numbers essentially indicate the invariantly computed visual information between uh, each pair of users. How do you compute mutual information? So you can you can build a uh, basically a joint distribution. Have enough data, build the joint distribution, build the marginal distribution, build the product of the marginal distribution, and from first principles compute the average quantity, uh, average speed to ratio of the log distribution. Essentially, the scale between the product and the parent distribution. So, you need assumptions on the observations as a function of time? So you, need, you need assumptions that each pair, of, so here we're doing single level mutual effect. Assumptions that they're acting as high ID pairs, they're not cannot coordinate. Yeah. So we again did that using like, you know, removing okay. certain circumstances. Okay. So here also we can see that the mutual information that uh, non the amount of information that Eve has about Alice and Bob is about an order of magnitude or more. It's lower than what Alice and Bob share. Alright, so so here I'll talk about the trade-off between error rate and rate. How many secret bits per second can you get out? Now obviously, if you're trying to pair two users, Alice and Bob, you want to be able to do this as quickly as possible. This will take forever. So an important question is, if you're using a real FM channel or a TV channel, how quickly can you pair them? How quickly can you give them, let's say, 128 bit key? So let's analyze this a little bit more in detail. Suppose Alice and Bob generate R bits per second. This is not the final key, they're actually generating R bits per second. And these bits differ with the probability of epsilon. So empirically speaking about epsilon of these bits, the fraction of epsilon of these bits is different than Alice and Bob's. This situation is equivalent to one where you have a binary symmetric channel with a crossover probability of epsilon uh, corresponding capacity of one minus binary, binary entropy function of epsilon. And Alice is sending bits to Bob through this channel. So just imagine that there's this imaginary channel uh, with crossover probability of epsilon. And Alice is sending bits through this channel to Bob. So about epsilon fraction of these bits will get this over. Okay. If this epsilon is very high, if the error rate is very high, 
then we need very long codes to get a appreciable grade. I'll tell you what this means now. Let's focus on this figure for a while. This figure shows on the x-axis distance between Alice and Bob. And on the y-axis, it shows this fraction of which that differ, epsilon, between Alice and Bob. Now, this green curve is obtained by a simulation from our analytical model that I showed you. What this green curve is saying is that even at around 0.1 lambda, tenth of a lambda, the fraction of which that differ in Alice and Bob is about 20%, so extremely high. Okay, and uh, it saturates 0.5 very quickly. And these red lines are, are practically observed results from uh, physical measurements. So obviously, unless they're very, very close to one another, the fraction of bits that differ will be very high. So, and the problem is, if you have such a high error rate, you need very long codes. And to build very long codes, you need to tolerate a very long delay. So this becomes counterintuitive. You don't want to tolerate a long delay because you want to get over, over with this process very quickly. To take an example, if this epsilon is 15%, then if you use a rate quarter NDPC code, uh, you need a block length of 1,008 bits to bring the error rate down from 15% to 3.5. So this is actually put from Gallagher's thesis, and it tells you how long of a delay you need, just to get a figure of how long a delay you need to fix such a high error rate. Instead, we ask the question, can we do better than this? Can we lower the epsilon? So we want to lower fraction of bits that are an error, but we're willing to trade off the rate at which we're getting these bits, this R. So here I define R and epsilon. R is the rate in per second that I'm getting these bits, and epsilon is the fraction of bits that are an error. Can I buy a lower epsilon by lowering R also, so that overall I'm better off? And the answer is yes, we can trade a lower R for lower epsilon, because remember we're dealing with stochastic processes, not discrete, discrete sources. They're not discrete time sources, they're, they're processes. Uh, so we define this quantity effective rate, R tilde, which is a product of this rate R and the capacity of this imaginary DSC, binary symmetric channel. Okay. All right, so how do we get, how do we trade off this epsilon and R? So first observation is let us not treat these processes as discrete sources. We observe that the extrema at Alice and Bob, that is the maxima and the minima, are much better matched than the actual quantized values. What does this mean? It means that we change the coding procedure slightly. Okay, instead of quantizing the values of the stochastic processes from time to time, Alice now goes through her entire stochastic process and figures out where does she have maxima to get this picture on here. So what this means is Alice says, okay, here I have a maxima, here I have a minima, and so on. And it turns out that the the, play, the points in time where these maxima and minima occur are much better matched in the sense that if you try to get bits out of this instead of quantizing them, then the error rate is much, much lower. So for example, we saw that at point 0.1 lambda, we reduced the error rate from 20% to 3%. And we had to tolerate a modest drop in rate. So in this, for this particular example, the rate at which you're generating these bits falls by a factor of two. Okay, vector quantization can improve this R tilde. So R tilde is the effective rate. And, we, and, and vector quantization can improve this R tilde even further. We haven't gone down that path yet. So this is my support. How do I know Alice and Bob have the same understanding of what time is? Right. Uh, so yeah, Alice and Bob need some sort of synchronization uh, before this entire protocol begins. They need to, they need to know that t equals zero for Alice is the same as t equals zero for Bob. Uh, and they can do this essentially by using the same uh, source, the same public source can serve as a common reference for both Alice and Bob. Uh, for example, Alice can send a small portion of her demodulated FM signal to Bob uh, when she sends that code offset. Uh, and you know, she sends this small portion of her, uh, a small snippet of her audio signal, and she says where this begins, where t equals zero is, and Bob can use that to find his t equals zero, a line point equals zero. So essentially, the same public source that they're using to can, can use to form a common reference. Also, we found that shaking devices helps to improve R. R is the rate of the bits. 
so we estimated coherence time of the channel using an estimate of the level crossing rate, where there exists an empirical relationship between the level crossing rate and the coherence time. And this coherence time uh, can be artificially decreased, it should be, and this is a typo. Uh, TC can be artificially decreased if Alice and Bob are shaken together, where it increases the level crossing rate. So this, these plots show for TV and FM uh, signals how the coherence time changes. And we observe that the coherence time can be made to go down by a factor of about two. So you get about a two X increase in break if you really shake them fast. You shake them slowly and then you shake them really fast. Yeah. How, how much did you shake them? It's <laughs> a very important please, question. Please, please. Just explain it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, only only Rob and I know this. <laughs> so stationary was just stationary on the table. Uh, moving slowly was something like this. And yeah, going moving fast, pretty long fast. Moving faster was like very big, very vigorously shaking them as fast as you can. So the idea is that if you have so mobile this is not a little vibration. No, no, no. The cell phone on the way in, in, no. in the vibration mode. No. The idea is that you have to move them through more than lambda by two. Okay. To change the channel. Right? So this was very, like, moving them really fast. I almost got a black eye on one of it. <laughs> so and, if you move it really so fast. for all that work, you get an improvement of a factor of two in your figure and stuff. And the motivation was if, if both Alice and Bob are mobile devices, and you want really to be established on them, then you can shake them. If you're willing to shake them, you can do it in <laughs> less time. Right. There are other people who have shown that you can use accelerometers on the newer generation of phones. And when you shake these together, the accelerometer profiles have very correlated values. But I see a problem with that in the sense that if there's an advertisement that's observing this going on, or even a video that's being analyzed later, you can tell, you can predict what those accelerometer profiles are going to be. Whereas with the wireless space, I would be standing three feet away from you, and you're shaking it, I would not know what signal you're observing. Wouldn't it be easier to take some aluminum foil and just shake the aluminum foil around the device? Uh, no, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> Become six if you start shaking it very fast. Yeah, we'll see how we can increase the rate even further. But last point here is that shaking also provides another tangible benefit in the sense that if you if you do have an attacker that's within half a wavelength of you, uh, then if you move, if you start to shake your devices, and that the attacker also moves in relation to you, will not know what. Uh, pattern you're seeing, what changes in your C signal, the C channel you're seeing. So that then will become very obvious. It's a wee star in the study table. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the answer to the, the, the question that we just posed is we monitor multiple sources, essentially. And this was a luxury that we did not have in the first portion of my work. Now, since you're just using ambient sources, you can actually uh, monitor multiple sources and treat them approximately as independent sources at that point. And this will scale your R. Uh, so as an example, uh, what we did was we monitored uh, several radio channels that were adjacent to one another in radio spectrum. And we were able to monitor up to seven channels at once. Uh, and we, we tried to see how independent they are provide that they were traveling coming from different directions. So this plot basically shows the observations of Alice at the FM channel one versus channel two, channel two, channel three, channel two, channel one. And those numbers in the square are linear correlation coefficients. So these are basically pairwise correlation between three FM stations to see how dependent they really are. And compare this with what Alice and Bob would see from each channel one at a time. So correlation. Lack of correlation, and sometimes it's very, you know, 
Right. Was it the next week or something? Yeah. Uh, no, I think what we should have done was go with each destination. Um, and we plan to use Gavin Black, but I think Gavin, you should be honest. I mean, right. There's a such nice distribution of it was correlation. It was your right. I just did it, yeah. That's cool. But these are correlations that are not making sense. Um, but I think if it's we all the Alcyon, then it doesn't matter. Yeah. Uh, let's let's take the results. Is it Gaussian? Uh, no, at this point we're actually using just the magnitude. Okay, that's what you want to talk about. This question is great for its own type of thing. Where is it Gaussian? He is seeing that he's getting real for complex data that's not Gaussian. So, yeah, I've seen that too. Yes. The questions are good. I know. <laughs> okay, so essentially from the linear correlation coefficient point of view, we saw that. Correlations are much better for Alice and Bob versus different various things. And so the last part of this work, we considered a, a fairly strong result. We said, what if Eve herself is the transmitter that is transmitting these public radio waves? So Eve is Peter, in other words. And so the question that we pose is, can Eve force Alice and Bob to have uh, a, a predictable set of bits that are longer secret ones. Can she force the bits that are extracted by Alice and Bob? So let's analyze this by assuming that the transmit signal is a product of the magnitude and theta t cos j, theta t, is, theta, t, theta t is in phase. And we say that Eve can, has the power to arbitrarily change a of t and b of t. Never mind that she's uh, messing up with the FM programming. But a of t and t of t are arbitrarily controlling, are arbitrarily being controlled by Eve. So this is the question. And the answer is very interesting. If we use only magnitude as a means to extract secret bits, then the answer to this question is no. Meaning that Eve can influence the bits that Alice and Bob are getting. And the reason is that Alice and Bob have no way to figure out whether fluctuations in their received magnitude are due to the channel or due to the changes in the, in the transmit signal. Whereas if we use phase, then the answer changes a little bit. Space has this property that uh, it wraps around after two pi. Okay, so because of that, even if Eve arbitrarily modulates her phase, the phase of the transmit signal, after a certain amount of time, the coherence time in the channel kicks in, and the received signal is the sum of the transmit signal phase and the phase added by the channel. Okay, because of this wraparound property, Eve cannot predictably influence the change in the phase from one coherence time to the other. And so we can still use coherence time, sorry, we can still use phase as a way to extract bits. Uh, the only caveat is that the local oscillators at Alice and Bob are not synchronized. So they cannot quantize their uh, phase, the C signal phase. Instead, we do differential phase, and that gets, gets, sort of gets, rid, gets rid of the, uh, the differences in the uh, local oscillators. We use differential phase across a period of time, which we think is large enough, greater than coherence time. So, so how about this? Because uh, Eve also independently can change the phase, increase the phase, or change the phase later on tomorrow. Right. So we let Eve change the phase arbitrarily. But the you see, the randomness is coming from the channel. So imagine that this theta of T is being arbitrarily controlled by Eve. But there is another phi of t which is being added by the channel, and that phi of t changes in a random manner from one coherence time to the next. And if you look at only the change in phase from one coherence time to the next, there are two components to it. One is the change in phase due to the transmit signal, the other is the change in phase due to the channel. The second one, Eve cannot predict. So the, the evil sometimes change the phase where they did, sometimes change the right. Smaller. It doesn't matter. And because you add a random quantity that wraps yeah. around 2 pi. If it is big enough to hit the, to reduce the effect of the channel, the phase change of the channel. The reason it can never be big enough is because the phase wraps around after 2 pi. There's no notion of big enough. Right? There's no big or small. It wraps around after, after 2 pi, you're back to zero. Yeah, for example, the channel is like changes slowly, for example. 
is the thirteen degree. Okay. And the face, the give give is like need to give ninety degree, and the next time give like five degree. Okay. Okay. So there is big difference. So this big difference made you already overwhelmed the difference of the channel. So that's why you have to wait for a certain amount of time till the channel decorrelates. And so that means the 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 small number that the channel was is now a random number. Give me anywhere between zero and two pi. In fact, for a Riley Perry channel, it's uniformly distributed. So if you look from one coherence time to another coherence time, if you saw that the phase was zero, next coherence time it could be anything between zero and two pi. It doesn't matter what the eve has added on to that. Because of this wraparound property, because of the wraparound property, they were able to do this. And it's the same reason that they're not able to do this in magnitude. So it's AI, we also needed to see the difference of the phase. Right. So they don't want to like, it's really random. For them, they, they do want to. They're right next to each other. So, so let's see. They think the Dallas and Bob are the same point. No. They're, they're observing the same thing in that instant. So let's say the next instant, they're basically observing the same thing. So let's say the P of T is the you know, I think he's asking that. Is it going to be a problem for them to demodulate? It's not. They use different shapes and kind of different shapes. So the change in phase is basically uh, change in phase due to the channel and change in phase due to the transport signal. And this whole quantity wraps around two pi. Okay. So no matter how much you change this, if I observe this delta is across two instants of time, this, this has changed. Then this sum has also changed completely. That's the reason. And that's also the reason that we are not able to do this in magnitude because the magnitude does not wrap around. So, so, so I get the phase. I don't get the magnitude. So magnitude. So is the magnitude that's observed above, right, is still the magnitude of the transmit signal. The transmit signal with the channel modulated up on top. It's a product. Right, okay. So, so you know, there's some time when the channel goes up and down. So, it's still a random quantity yeah. around the knee. Uh, now, so let's say now I'm E, right. and I suddenly reduce the power of my transmit signal. You might think that it's a really bad phase. You have no way to distinguish. Uh, you might think it's a really bad phase. Okay. You have no way to distinguish a bad phase, B phase, from but, changes but in both phase. Al, uh, Alice and Bob will see a heat phase, and within that phase, they'll see some random stuff modulated yeah. on top of it. Yes. Right, so. Now, if the swings that I create from I as E create from the transmit signal are much larger than the swings that the channel is creating, then I can force you to extract a certain pattern of phase, like a 0, 1, 0, 1 phase. Okay, so you're really playing off the fact that there's a notion of dynamic range in how Which you get the range. magnitude estimate, and there's no yeah. such thing when you're talking about the phase. Yeah. Okay. So the problem ultimately comes down to we only have you know, ideally log. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, so in an ideal world where you have real valued estimates of the channel, this is not necessarily a problem. But once you have a finite here, that's right. So we tested this and by, uh, we made one of our USRPs E, and we recorded an FM signal and we played it back, uh, treating the changes in phase as being arbitrary changes that E had access to. The idea was to measure the, the mutual information between the differential phase at E, now E is the transmitter, so we can we have access to the differential phase at the transmitter, and the differential phase at Alice and Bob, versus the mutual information between the differential phase at Alice and Bob. So these plots basically are, are the results from those mutual information measurements. But Alice, these are basically differential phase between Alice and Bob, and now E, as the transmitter has access to differential phase, and her differential phase information contains almost no information about the differential phase information at Alice. Uh, and again, you see that mutual information uh, are different by more than an order of magnitude. Two orders of magnitude. So with that, uh, I'll end first and second part and move on to part three of this talk.
In part three, we studied uh, problem that arises in network streams. We do not have to be uh, wireless network streams necessarily, but the problem is exacerbated with wireless systems. The problem is that network streams often carry packetized data with packets that have variable packet sizes. And this often leaks out information in unintended ways. So to explain what I mean, I'll take um, a bunch of examples to illustrate this. The first example is a very simple one. Uh, consider a wireless sensing network in which various sense events correspond to uh, different packet sizes. Okay. So let's say there are n events, e1 to em, and uh, each of these corresponds to a different packet size, this one is m. Also assume that these packets are encrypted, but they are encrypted by a length preserving cipher. That means when you encrypt them, the length of the packet does not change. Then it's obvious that if you, as adversary, observe a packet of size sk, you can easily infer that event k has occurred. Okay, very simple. Example two is a more real life example. It's an actual attack that was discovered in 2007 and 2008 on encrypted VOIP streams that use variable length packet sizes. The idea of using these variable length packet sizes was that you can conserve bandwidth okay, by using variable bit rate. So uh, this, this figure is taken from uh, a paper uh, published in, in uh, IEEE Security and Privacy Symposium 2007. Uh, and what this is showing is that uh, if you speak into a uh, VOIP codec that has variable uh, variable bit rate, this is the this is the audio waveform. Then the sequence of packet sizes looks something like this. And you can see by looking at it visually that the packet sizes are highly correlated with what you see on the visual, uh, on, the, on the audio waveform. And by observing this, uh, the authors of this paper actually constructed a hidden Markov model to, to infer what was being spoken, uh, what language was being spoken, and so on. Uh, similar results have been shown in identifying video streams uh, and also web pages by observing encrypted web browsing packets. So here we have instances where you have encrypted data, and these data are leaking out information that we never thought was possible. As a third example, uh, consider an Alice and Bob, where Alice and Bob, Alice is trying to send some information to Bob over a, a network. It could be a wireless network. So actually think of this as a wireless network. And Eve is just uh, a third party who's not part of that network. Now, Alice can carefully encode the size of the packets that are going across this network on the ether, uh, it could be. And Eve is just observing the size of the packets. And Alice could leak out information to Eve, who is unauthorized, by doing this. So this is a form of second graphy of forward channel, where by modulating quantity that has that is not of much importance, uh, you can leak out information. So think of Eve as being a user sitting in the parking lot. And Alice and Bob are two users in the in inside of a corporation. Uh, you can leak out information to the user. Do they need uh, to decompose that? Not really. You just need to measure the sizes of the packets. And how do you know which of the two packets are the So you need you do need to have some common notion of semantics. In the sense, I need to know that here I have is the number two four zero one one two one three, which corresponds to these packet sizes. Uh, I need to know what this means to me. So the assumption is that Alice and Eve have some uh, pre-decided notion of what these numbers mean. What is what is this? How do we decode this? So there has to be some, but you don't need some strict uh, conditions for synthesis. So if you have equal size packets, it's very nice because it's not leaking any information. And I'll talk about that. So how can we prevent such information leaks from taking place? Variable packet sizes are found in many different places. So obviously, we cannot modify or rewrite all applications. What we can do is perhaps build an obfuscation mechanism that changes the packet size. Okay, and this is what we propose, in fact. Uh, we propose a, a mechanism which we call bit trap. Bit trap stands for building information theoretic privacy into streams. And the idea is to use this uh, mechanism as either a separate layer or a separate node that changes packet sizes uh, without violating certain constraints, which the user has specified. 
these constraints are constraints on resources. And the resources is what enables us to change these factor sizes. So the first resource. So both these things are, are problems. You might have a situation, uh, we're concerned about both project factors. But uh, in this work, piece of work, I'm only dealing with uh, a scenario where the timing is discrete. But I, I will address the timing also. There have been attacks where you have equal size packets, for example, in network streams. All the packets are power 24 bytes, but the timing is variable, and that also needs our information. Uh, they're somewhat equivalent in some ways, but. Uh, so in our model, we're considering a, a slotted time model where you can have a packet of size something from an alphabet. If you include if you zero in that alphabet, you can address the issue of variable timing also. So I'll come to that. So one obvious way to change packet sizes is to pad packets. Uh, what you're doing is after the packet the packet is created, uh, dummy bits can be added to each packet, and the cost is that you spend more. So you, you basically can lead to greater network load and congestion. Another resource is delay, where you can change the sizes of packets just by buffering them and changing the boundaries between packets rather than adding any new bits at all. And all this assumes that you also have a certain amount of constant header information that explains to the other side how to reassemble the packet or how to which bits to throw away. So our goal in this work is basically to figure out what is the best obfuscation level achievable when there is a limit on the amount of resources that are available to us, and how do we achieve this optimum? So let's begin with a very simple case of a single packet. Uh, so consider a single packet traveling across a central network. And like I said, there are, let's say, m events in the central network, w1, w2, m, with uh, corresponding probabilities, v1 to pm, and n different packet sizes. Let the true size be denoted by A, which is a member of the set A1 to AM, and we add a random quantity Z to it. Uh, Z is a non-negative random variable uh, with EMF P of Z. Okay, and D is the modified packet size. So to measure the amount of obfuscation, we use uh, conditional entropy. That is the uncertainty in the event W that actually took place by observing after observing the packet size S. You have true size modified by packet size. What's yeah? Uh, I think actually this may be redundant. S one are just is an alphabet to tell you later. Just you could ignore this packet size, but don't you make the word. You could use uh, actually you can. There's some notational inconsistency basically. You could you think of S and A as the same thing. Okay, yeah. That's an A that is yeah. S and A is the same thing. So it so can can print more packets if the N could N could be greater than N. Yes. N and M don't have to be the same thing. In the sense that the modi the set of modified sizes could be much larger or uh, different in, in general from the set of packet sizes. So using conditional entropy basically serves as an upper bound for statistical inference. Since we don't know ahead of time what is the exact algorithm a potential attacker would use to infer uh, various different types of algorithms have been used in, in literature, uh, such as Nick Markov models and so on. We use entropy because it serves as an upper bound. So yeah, actually we'll add this later. This is just to show you an example of this one. Average across S to get an average speed of what the algorithm is. So our goal is essentially to maximize this average quantity. Uh, uncertainty in W given S, such that your Z is bounded. So Z is the number of bits that you're adding onto it. So sorry, wouldn't wouldn't you want to so the actual information that's that the attacker is interested in yeah. is it the packet S or is it the event W? What is the attacker trying? It's the same thing. We assume that there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between 
the packet S and the event W for this very simple model. We just for this model, let's assume there's just one packet going across the network. Okay. Just observe one packet in isolation, and you want to know what the true packet size was. It's a, it's a very simple baseline. Okay. So, and this happens every now and then whenever an event is detected across the network. So the goal is to maximize this uncertainty in W after observing S. Okay. So actually, there's some inconsistency here. This should be D actually. Okay. If you go by what this is saying, I use S as just to mean size, but A and D can both be described to S. Okay. So uh, one of my colleagues at Inlab, Kamran Kamran, in 2007 postulated that this is a hard problem and proposed a greeting algorithm for this. And we essentially showed that this is actually an interesting problem because it turns out to be a convex problem. So obfuscation of the size of a single packet with a constraint on the average number of padding bits is a convex programming problem. And what this boils down to is that there exists a unique optimum in the sense, how should I allocate a certain number of average bits that you to is bounded how should I allocate it to different packets? There exists a unique optimum, and this optimum is computable in, in, in time polynomials in the number of variables. Let's see what number of variables are there. So our goal is to maximize entropy of A given D. So this is more formal. Entropy of the actual size given the observed size. Uh, and the variables are the reverse, entropy of D given A. How do I allocate a certain, how do I assign a certain observed value, uh, packet size to a modified packet size? So this can be thought of as uh, basically a transition matrix, probably a transition matrix. And this matrix P is essentially a set of variables. So Pij is probably that D equals Dj, where D, Ds are chosen from a certain set when A equals, uh, or this should be I here, sorry. This should be I. So Pij is probably D equals Dj when A equals Ai. And we obviously have constraints. Our constraints is that the average number of bits that we add to a packet must be bounded uh, from above by a certain quantity. And uh, we have constraints on these Pij's in that they must sum up to one for every uh, observed packet size. So a very simple constructive proof for this statement is that Packet padding can be treated as a discrete memory length channel. Okay. So think of a discrete memory length channel as one where a two packet size is entering and a modified packet size is leaving. And you have to transition from the two packet size to the modified packet size only from smaller packets to higher packets. So we can easily enforce this by putting a cost to this discrete memory length channel. And the cost structure is as, is as follows. So going back. Cij is the cost of the transition from Ai to Dj, and the cost is simply Dj minus Ai, where Dj and Ai are sizes. Okay. And set Cij equal to infinity when Dj is smaller than Ai. So this will basically uh, uh, remove all solutions where you're going from a larger packet to a smaller packet. All these transitions are from small packets to larger packets. And the moment you say that this problem can be looked at as a discrete memoryless channel, we know that. Uh, the uh, conditional uncertainty, conditional entropy in A given D uh, becomes a convex function of this channel, which is the conditional, which is the conditional distribution of D given A. So we know immediately that finding the optimum becomes a problem that's polynomial in the size of P, and the size of P is uh, the product of the size of the sets A and B. So A is the sizes that packets, the original packets in the network can take, and B is the modified set of packets. So how big should B be? We haven't said anything about that. It turns out that at the optimum, the output alphabet D can be exactly the same as the input alphabet A. So D does not need to be any, any larger or smaller than A at the optimum. The optimum is one where the conditional entropy is satisfied. So I won't go into the detail to prove this, uh, but essentially this follows from the fact that uh, Falls from the fact that you can reduce your cost every time you move probability mass 
to a lower traffic value and from the fact that H is concave. Uh, so again, I won't go into the great detail to this, it's in the thesis. And this result basically fixes the number of variables that we have in this problem to this quantity. Okay. So basically this, the size of the matrix P gets fixed. And so this sort of formalizes the result because now we're saying that the problem is convex and it's computable, the optimal is computable in time polynomial in the number of variables, but the number of variables is also fixed. So it turns out that the uh, there's a great distortion type relationship between the, the function that we're trying to optimize. Uh, here, I, uh, I written this function as mutual information between the actual packet size and the observed packet size. Uh, and the padding budget. As you increase the padding budget, the amount that you can lower the mutual information by uh, has a convex decreasing relationship. And at some value of padding budget, B equal to B max, you can pad all the packets to the largest packet size. And so the mutual information goes down to zero. Okay, this is also intuitive. And one of the solutions for removing these leakage channels is every single packet that you get, just pad it to the size of the largest packet. And if your budget allows you to do that, that's the best thing to do. All right. Uh, we may also want to morph a, a distribution to another distribution. So let's say we have a, a certain distribution of packet sizes, P1 or A, and we want the observe, we want the adversary to think that it's a different distribution. It's probably something else. So how can we morph a packet size distribution? The cost of this morphing is simply the difference between the mean of the two distributions, usually. But uh, you cannot morph from one distribution to, to any other any other distribution. The condition that must be satisfied is that the accumulated distribution function of uh, the first distribution, the one you're morphing from, must majorize the other distribution. And this basically follows from the fact that the output of the DMC is always greater than the input. So what this means is that there's a preference relation among distributions from which we can morph from one to the other. Uh, basically, if you, if you can rank all distributions corresponding to different scenarios, then you can move from PI to PJ only if J is bigger than I. And one uh, uh, something earlier in this chain majorizes something later in this chain. But this restriction can be lifted if small amounts of delay are introduced into the system, into the observation. Because delay will now allow us to go from a smaller packet to a larger packet. Um, so when you put a little bit of delay, you can uh, bypass these restrictions. On the contrary, we'll see that delay or buffering is not of use when you have multiple packets, because the total packet size can still be visible to the adversary. So as an example, uh, we studied uh, case of HTTP responses, basically web browsing. Uh, in 2002, there was an attack uh, also in Oakland that showed that just by observing the number and size of the packets in HTTP responses, you can, with very high likelihood, identify which website it is. And this was uh, potentially very damaging because you know, oppressive regimes in the world can use this to figure out what websites are uh, accessing on the World Wide Web. So what we did was, we said obfuscate the total size rather than each packet separately. Okay? And basically this, we took the thousand most visited web pages on the World Wide Web, according to Google. And so the plot on the left shows you the sizes of these websites, cumulative sizes of the HTTP response, uh, modulo 100 kilobytes. Okay? So this is basically a probability mass function. And if you were to figure out which class a certain website belongs to just by observing the size of the of the total HTTP response. This quantity can be obfuscated just by padding. So think of these as, as single packets rather than uh, a sequence of packets. So by padding, depending on the padding budget, it can cause varying amounts of obfuscation. For example, we found that just by adding uh, seven kilobytes of dummy traffic, you can bring down the mutual information to about half its original value. Whereas in order to remove, to bring mutual information down to zero, you need almost 40 kilobytes. So this is just a simple example for the padding case. 
So now we move to the more interesting case of streams, where instead of single packets, you have streams of data flowing through. And now it's no longer sufficient to use single letter bits of information as a metric for how much obfuscation we are causing. So we define a new metric for streams, which is mutual information rate. Mutual information rate is the rate at which one stochastic process gives you information about another stochastic process. And it can be simplified to be expressed in a form where we only need to be concerned about the relationship between the two stochastic processes. So this is the mutual information rate of A uh, minus the rate at which you learn about A from B. Assuming that the stream is long enough, you can drop this limit n down to infinity. And uh, this minimization of this quantity boils down to maximization of that second term there. So here's our model for our stream obfuscator. Essentially, we have a stream of packets flowing into this box with our obfuscator. And A1, A2, A3 are essentially packet sizes. And now we have two things going on. Zn is the dummy bits that are added at step n. And Yn is the content of a buffer. So we're buffering as we're adding dummy bits. And this sequence is a sequence of bits of packets that are going out, sizes of packets that are going out. So what happens when a packet comes in, and the figure on the right is, uh, buffer content yn uh, goes to xn when an comes in, and dn leaves. Now we have yn plus one. Yeah. So, anything going back to your comment earlier, that every time a slot is basically every yeah. time something's coming out might be zero, but yeah. it's something. Right. So we dealt with the case of uh, timing uh, between packets by including zero in the alphabet of a and b. So that basically takes care of varying timing between packets. So the objective here is again to minimize the mutual information rate. And now instead of just a constraint on dummy uh, packets, dummy sizes, dummy bits, we have two constraints, which is uh, on padding as before and a constraint on the mean delay. And we translate that uh, to the queue size. Why here is the queue size? Essentially, this is like a queue. So we translate this constraint to the queue size, and we don't want the mean queue size to exceed a certain fixed quantity. OK, obfuscation by padding only. Uh, coming to our results, if you're just doing padding in this fashion, you're not doing any buffering, and you find that if the stream A is ID, such that the packets all have uh, sizes that have nothing to do with their prior packets or future packet sizes, then uh, it's a straightforward extension of the single packet case. So you can take each packet, treat it like single packet case, and the dummy number of bits. Whereas when you have non-ID streams, instead of using this, the, the variable P of D given A, a simple discrete memory list channel, you now need to include memory in the channel uh, and keep your variable as P of D given A K. A K is a sequence uh, of the last K packets. Okay? And this is required to, to meet optimality. Uh, an interesting theorem here is, even in the case of streams, the output alphabet can be shown to be uh, the same as the input alphabet. You do not need anything different or larger in particular than the input alphabet for optimality. Uh, the proof follows essentially from the proof for single packets. Uh, I won't go into the details, but basically consider Bn, sequences Bn and An as being vector output and vector input of a vector B and C. And using B of D equals A, the alphabets D equals A reduces cost and can only improve the condition entropy. So again, the detailed proof is in my thesis. Okay, obfuscation by buffering only. Uh, this is an interesting case. Now we're trying to obfuscate without adding any padding bits by adding delay only. Okay. So the model is uh, we have a certain random variable S. Uh, which follows a distribution uh, P of S. And SI are independent uh, random variable things from this distribution, independent from uh, A. And at each time step, I output uh, a packet of size DI, which is min of XI and SI. That means I pick a value S, SI, and I check whether the buffer has that much in it. If it does, then I shrink out. If it doesn't, then I have, then I shrink out whatever is in the buffer. Now it can be shown that uh, of all distributions possible for this S, only those distributions for which the mean of S is less than the mean packet size coming in 
will allow you to have a, a, uh, a queue that is that will not blow up infinitely. So you need to have uh, p of s such that the mean of s is less than the mean of the a. And our objective is essentially the same as before. We want to minimize the mutual information rate with respect to p of s now, such that the mean key size is less than a bounded quantity. So this turns out to be an interesting model. Um, and it's been studied in the past by Thomas, this is Joy Thomas, who worked at Google for Tom Cooper. In 1995, he showed that the mean Q length is a decreasing and convex function of the PMS, uh, the PMF, P of S. Uh, so what this tells us is that this constraint on the right, P of Y is that P of Q, is a, is a convex function of our variable P of S. What we don't know is whether the objective function itself is a convex function. And that is our conjecture, essentially. Our conjecture is that mutual information rate is a convex function of the distribution P of S. We have not been able to prove this conclusively, but we have shown that there is a way to compute this quantity E of Y, the mean Q size, and the mutual information rate taking a D using a 2D Markov chain framework. So this sort of led us to a, a kind of a dead end in the sense that we're not able to show that the mutual information between A and B is convex. But interestingly, if we now enable both buffering and padding in the same box, then the situation becomes much easier, easier to analyze. So uh, because the model collapses back to a discrete memory of time. And this is very interesting because you have a queue sitting inside this box, and you would think that it's a, it's a channel with memory, but it's actually a channel without memory. Because what this allows us to do is uh, it allows transitions from larger packets to smaller packets. So whenever you have a transition of a larger packet to a smaller packet, the extra bits are added onto a buffer, which is a queue, that's the first and first out queue. When you have a transition from a larger packet, from a, from a smaller packet to a larger packet, the extra bits are first gotten from the buffer if, if they're there. If they're not there, then the remaining amount is fulfilled by adding dummy bits. That's the bit of that. So up until this point, you haven't actually been breaking up that, right? No, we have. In the previous one, we have, but we weren't able to show that it's a comment problem. Okay. So in this problem, we are buffering packets. So you're buffering, but you're actually breaking them up as we're sending them out. Of it. Yes. It's, it's not just buffering to randomize the delay. No. It's buffering. This is where I break the packet down. And I say that the output packet is min of a random quantity and the Q and Q size. So, so would if you break packet chain in a in a in a typical sort of IP network, right? If this is the IP protocol, would this be a problem if I've got just packets coming into would the DAP be the IP problem? No, the fact that you're breaking up packets. It would not be a problem as long as you encapsulate it properly and you have enough header information to tell the other side how to do the same. So are you also actually making a TCP packet per IP? Because at IP layer, most things are 1500 bytes. So things that are stored. Uh, it actually looks obfuscated. But then if we can look at the TCP level and figure out that you're going to YouTube because it has a certain signature. So we are actually not working with, we sort of abstracted out of that level, we are not we are working with respect to things of how it maps to each case, because the IP case something in a large gate and the whole, uh, like the web access case that we discussed now, there wouldn't be much information there in the other issue is IP is really not there's no longer a notion of connection, so I've got all these packets coming in. They can have a thousand different destinations. Right. So right. What you've done is you've broken them up into a time. No, the modern browser can analyze that, but the Chinese government is trying to see if you're accessing yeah. some cool. If you're looking at, at a router, if you're looking at a link that's closer to the endpoint. No, but what I'm saying is from the point of view of placing the buffer in there that breaks them up and then reassembles them, you have to do it for a connection. So that you're doing at the edge. Yeah. Oh, that you're doing at the edge, not at the edge. That's right. This is being done at the edge. 
So, yeah, we haven't worked with this system level yet. So we started at flight cloud problem that we have these variations which are not intended and how much information we're leaking out, how do you destroy it with the next piece of Okay, so here what we've done is basically by putting small amounts of buffering and padding together, we've gone back to the model of a discrete memory that we have. And so what did you mean by that? Does that still happen? You just said yes. We haven't considered that yet. Maybe we should give it some free time. <laughs> so. Beta is almost yeah. four yeah. four six again. Yeah, and then we can use two beta. So going back to a discrete memory of channel meant that the obfuscation of a stream of packet sizes with constraints on average bit padding and average delay becomes again a convex optimization problem. Uh, and I won't go into the proof of this, but the sketch is very simple. We have two constraints and one objective function, and we can show that all three of them are convex in this quantity P. So P no longer has a constraint that we must go from a smaller packet to a large packet. But it's again a fixed size P because we proved that the alphabets do not need to differ. Alphabet sizes do not need to differ. And as a corollary of this, uh, this is what we've been trying to work towards. Actually, this shows on the z-axis mutual information is great, and on the two axis are the amount of padding budget and the delay budget, which are denoted by P and Q. And so now we have a complete picture of this, how mutual information rate varies in this plane alone on a single packet case, where as you change, as you increase your budget, you have a convex increase in the integer. And in this, in these three dimensions, you have a surface which is also convex. And what that means is that if you take, if you go from a point here, adding a small amount of delay, you can do much better. Uh, you can have big gains in reducing the mutual information uh, versus using just one of those two quantities, uh, either padding or delay. So it shows that the 3D surface is convex. Is convex. Yeah. But as you collapse it, Onto one of the planes. Onto one of the planes. It's, it's, you can it's no longer. You can no longer show that that, that it's convex. Yes, the re that sounds a little weird. The reason is that when you collapse it onto that surface, the model itself changes. It's not that it's the same model. So, in all points in this three-dimensional space, except for points on that plane, we're using the same model. So, any line in this three-dimensional uh, region. It will also be convex. But as soon as you hit points on that plane, uh, it, we cannot show it because the model must change. So, what happens if I get infinitesimally close to that plane? Yeah. Really, really close. You go towards infinity, you meet that plane. As you get closer and closer, you see these lines, right? These are oh, called two. I'll, okay, I see. Yeah, so as you get closer and closer to only delay case, no padding, then you have to go. You have to go. So I will stop with that. With a quick, instead of giving a summary of everything I said, I'll give a quick uh, point by point uh, summary of what we could have done also. And this is sort of just meant to, to fill the gaps and to, 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 to make clear uh, which problems can be picked upon if anybody is interested in picking up on that. Uh, we did not address we did not address the issue of how to adapt quantization coding to real time transmissions. I think that's a good uh, important problem. Uh, resisting active attacks better using key extraction. That's a general area that we did not venture too much into. Vector quantization themes. We are very confident that it will improve the rate, but we found it extremely hard to design those vector quantizers. Uh, can steerable beam directional antenna be used? At one end, as Alice and Bob, to artificially induce a higher key extraction rate. Uh, this, I think, is a very interesting problem, but uh, I haven't been able to work on it. Uh, it's, it's not as intuitive as it sounds because as you as you point an antenna in a certain direction, the amount of entropy available to you also goes down in the sense that the you're not you no longer you're no longer able to use the result that your C signal is a combination of uh, rays from all the different directions. Okay. Uh, what happens when reconfiguration fails when you're trying to make both of those things the same? Can we use a simpler 
Could you just simple hybrid ARQ that mechanism to impact your grids without layers? For part three, uh, an interesting problem is, is there a mutual information saddle point for the practice side channel? What this uh, means is, is there a certain fixed strategy that we can use in the office data irrespective of what the input distribution is, how the input distribution is changing? And this is this is an important practical question because in practice, it's very difficult to form this layer or the separate node about what application level has to coming down. You may not have access to the actual distribution. Uh, additionally, working with a jitter constraint instead of just a mean constraint on the array. Should uh, this layer create a trained profile for every type of traffic class and apply it? Exactly like I just said, this is a hard thing to do in practice. And how can we easily specify a set of resource constraints for a wide variety of traffic classes? So I'll stop with that. And uh, before I open for questions, I'd just like to say thanks to a number of people. Uh, my colleagues at GridLab, fellow students and friends who have over the years given me a lot of help and inspiration at various points in time. Uh, also a number of people in, in the faculty at Rutgers and outside uh, who have helped in various different ways. Uh, providing inspiration and uh, inviting me to come and discuss problems with them. And finally, uh, a big thanks to my advisors, Professor Ray Chappie and Professor Mandia, uh, who have been trusting me with their grant funds for six years. And they've given me lots of uh, gracious amounts of academic freedom and necessary, necessary So with that, I'll stop and I'll open.